Hi, I'm Rachel from EVPL Central, and this is Chapter Book Storytime, The Variety Pack. Today we're going to be reading The Missing Piece of Charlie O'Reilly by Rebecca K.S. Ansari. So in this book, we are obviously going to be meeting Charlie O'Reilly, and he has a bit of a unique situation going on. Everyone knows him as an only child. His parents only ever had one son. But unfortunately, Charlie remembers that that is not true. He used to have a brother named Liam, but for some reason, he is the only one who could remember Liam ever existed. All right, so take a moment to get settled in and get ready to listen, and we will see what happens with Charlie and his missing brother. Chapter one. Charlie O'Reilly was an only child. It therefore made everyone uncomfortable when he talked about his little brother. Liam, the kid who sang incessantly, left his dirty socks on the floor and messed up Charlie's carefully arranged comic books. The one who both drove him insane and made him laugh until his side hurt. That little brother. But Liam didn't do that stuff anymore because he didn't exist. And according to nearly everyone in Charlie's life, he never did. Please, Charlie, his father would say, removing his reading glasses and tipping his head to the ceiling. Not again. After a year of seeing that look on his father's face, Charlie learned to keep quiet. At home, anyway. But he had to talk during his visits to Dr. Barton's office. Session after session, perched on her couch, the cushions dented by him and countless other troubled kids. Dr. Barton had spent months explaining, in that tone that made Charlie feel like he was four years old instead of almost 12, that his imaginary brother was a perfectly normal psychological ex response to all the stress at home. All the stress. The code words that every adult used for Charlie's mother. People don't just vanish from everyone's memory, Charlie, Dr. Barton had said at their first session, and your parents could never forget one of their own children. But Liam had, and his parents did. Charlie understood one important thing from his weekly sessions. No one was listening. Today, however, was different. There was nothing Dr. Barton or his dad could say that could ruin Charlie's good mood. The next 24 hours held too much promise and hope for Charlie to let the doubters get him down. It's nice to see you in good spirits, Dr. Barton said over her cup of tea. She was tucked into her overstuffed leather chair, a perpetual electric waterfall burbling beside her. The sound of the waterfall was supposed to be soothing, but all it ever did for Charlie was make him need to go to the bathroom. Well. It's a big day tomorrow, Charlie said with a smile. I know. It's your birthday, she said. Yep, and one year to the day since Liam disappeared. Charlie's father, sitting awkwardly beside him on the sofa, wilted at these words. Dr. Barton drew in a slow, deep breath. Charlie knew what these sessions were about, to coax him into finally uttering, Liam isn't real. Those three little words held the power to stop all the appointments, frustration, and hand-wringing. And as such, these sessions were pointless. Charlie would sit on his couch until he, on this couch until he was 80 before he would say those words. Charlie's loyalty was stronger than whatever force had taken his brother away and wiped him from everyone's memories. Just think of what we could accomplish if we spent this time actually looking for Liam instead of sitting here babbling, Charlie thought. As you know, Charlie, Dr. Barton said, your father and I believe something happened last May. We just don't understand exactly what. Why don't you tell us about that day one more time? Charlie stared at the bowl of fidget balls on the table between them. They had dissected his 11th birthday countless times. In Dr. Barton's quest to figure out what had really happened, the truth apparently wasn't good enough. He sighed. I went to bed the night before my birthday. Liam was there in the bunk above mine. When I woke up the next morning, he was gone. Charlie recounted every detail. How the top bunk had vanished. How Liam's Legos and stuffed animals and posters and clothes and favorite cereal had disappeared from the house as cleanly as his existence had been scrubbed from everyone's minds. Charlie told the story slowly. They had an hour to kill, after all. In each telling, Charlie offered up everything he could remember about that terrible morning and the days that followed. 
Charlie's dad would rub his back reassuringly as Dr. Barton ticked through her usual probing questions, most of them about his mom. But she never asked about the night before, about what happened between him and Liam before they went to bed. Which was convenient because Charlie was never going to tell her that was none of her business. Only Anna, Charlie's best friend, got to know about that. The fact that Liam's disappearance was Charlie's fault. Finally, Dr. Barton brought the session to a close with an unsatisfied sigh. Well, our time is up for today. I'll see you both next week. Not if I can help it. Charlie popped up and headed down to the hall, giving the adults the space they needed to whisper about him at the office doorway. Have a happy birthday tomorrow, Dr. Barton called after him. Oh, I will. Good work today, his dad said with a forced smile, the thud of the car door punctuating his last word. I'm proud of you. Thanks, Charlie said, pretty sure the look on his dad's face five minutes ago hadn't been pride. Have you made all your birthday wishes, bud? I only have one, Charlie thought, but said, yep, instead. His dad thought all he wanted was a Nerf gun and a few comics. They pulled onto the highway and Charlie watched the town of Kingsburg, New York slide past in the purple early evening light. New condos and shops mixed with old industrial buildings and warehouses, all under the ever watchful eye of the old abandoned orphanage in the highest hill. It's going to work. He repeated to himself until he pulled into the driveway past the crooked and sudden bleached invisible fence sign no one had bothered to remove in the ten months since their Australian shepherd, Dipsy, had passed away. Can you get the door for me, Charles? Dad said. I still can't find my remote. Charlie grabbed his backpack and hopped out. As he flipped up the plastic cover of the garage door keypad, a fat, icy drop of water splattered on the tip of his nose. He looked up and almost caught the next drop in his eye. A blanket of blackened leaves clogged the gutter, dispensing yesterday's spring rain and little dive bombs. Green shoots stretched skyward from the eaves, having found a fertile home in their choked roof line. These weeds in the gutter mirrored those that, had, that were taking over the yard. Overgrown plants that Charlie's mother would never have allowed in her meticulously tended flower beds now thrived. The woody reeds of last year's lilies lay in thick and a thick mat over the soil and nothing but a few meager tulip shoots struggled toward daylight. Charlie followed the car into the garage, stepping into the dark house and immediately stumbled over something heavy in the mudroom. With a flick of the lights, his heart sank. Sitting by the door was his father's suitcase. It's just for a week, bud, his dad said, reading Charlie's face. We're getting an exhibit on loan from the Smithsonian and they need me in Washington, DC. You're not going to be here for my birthday, Charlie said. He didn't care about parties or gifts, but he worried his father might need to be home for his plan to work. His dad gently lifted Charlie's chin. I hate it too, bud. I did everything I could to get out of this one, but there was no changing it. It's a kind of key part of the job. Charlie looked at his dad and nodded. You know, I'd be here if I could. Charlie did know that. He knew a lot of things, that his dad's promotion at the Museum of Natural History meant a lot of trips out of town, that the raise that came with a new job was necessary to replace some of mom's income that she, that he should be thankful they hadn't moved out of this house in Kingsburg to be closer to New York City. Knowing all of this, however, didn't make it easier. It seemed like his dad was gone more than he was home these days, and the geodes, t-shirts, and shark teeth that filled Charlie's room for museums around the world did nothing to make it feel less empty. As always, Anna and her folks are right across the street if you need anything, his father said, as if Charlie had forgotten where his best friend lived. And I told Mrs. Gleason I'd be gone too, but I asked her not to check in on you this time without calling first. Charlie grimaced. There was no catastrophe that it could inspire him to turn to their 70-year-old neighbor. Even if she didn't smell like cigarette smoke and look like a bespectacled crested crane, she seemed just a little too interested in what happened in the O'Reilly's house. Apparently, some people got pleasure from the misery of others. The exhibit should be pretty cool, his dad said. It's a 48-foot fossilized snake skeleton they found in Columbia. We'll go see it together when I get back. 
Dad, I hate snakes. Charlie pressed his lips together to stop himself from adding, Liam loves snakes, you should take him. It's not like it's alive, but it'll be fun. Charlie wondered if his dad ever got tired of being so upbeat. The light that kept trying to penetrate the ever-present darkness in their house, it seemed exhausting. Anyway, his dad said, I have the usual list of things to do while I'm gone. Why don't you go and say hi to mom while I grab some stuff from upstairs, and then we can go through it before I take off. Charlie nodded and walked into the family room. Josie O'Reilly sat in her cave on the couch, staring at the television that hadn't been turned on in days. Her morning coffee was still on the end table, half full, and capped in a skin of cold milk. Charlie clicked the lamp on and lowered himself beside her. He moved a clump of her hair behind her ear and gave her a soft kiss on the cheek. Buried deeply under the musty odor of the unwashed hoodie she wore every day was the distant but comforting scent of mom. Aveda shampoo, Dove soap, and something that always reminded Charlie of grapefruit. Even on her worst days, when everything seemed upside down, this fragment of the past calmed him. It gave him hope that his vibrant, adoring mother was right there, just under the surface, ready to spring back to life any day now. A faint smile lifted the slack in her cheeks at his touch. You're home, she said. She was half under a blanket, her fingers tangled in the edge. Yep. He leaned into her and wiped at her at his eyes. If it were years ago, she would ask him about his day or tell him she loved him and throw her arms around him. Now she sagged slightly under his weight. Charlie closed his eyes, knowing the ache in his chest would pass. It always did. Do you need anything? He asked. Want me to warm up your coffee? She shook her head. After a few silent minutes, Charlie rose. Love you. Her silence chased him out of the room. Dad was a whirlwind of activity in the kitchen, packing up his carry-on and adding final notes to his list for Charlie. He handed Charlie the scrap of paper, most of which was familiar at this point. Drag the trash and recycling to the curb Monday morning. Do the dishes every night. Bring the mail in after you get home from school. Lock the doors and make sure all the lights are off before bed. Remind mom to shower. Try to get mom out for a few walks together. What do these last two say? Charlie asked, pointing at the bottom of the list. Despite inheriting his father's horrific handwriting, Charlie was no better at deciphering it than anyone else. Dad looked over his shoulder. Oh, the first one says to pick up mom's prescriptions on Tuesday. They can't fill them until then, but Lindsay and Donna at the pharmacy know you have permission to get them. He squeezed Charlie's shoulders and kissed him on the forehead. And the last one says, have fun on your birthday. Charlie nodded and let himself be brought in for a hug. I'll see you next Sunday, okay? This should be the last trip for a while, I promise. He waited for Charlie to nod. Love you, bud. Take care of your mom. And with one last squeeze, he was off. Charlie watched out the window as their ancient sedan backed out of the garage and his father tooted the horn in three short bursts as he drove away. Dinner. Charlie's stomach growled as he crossed to the kitchen cupboard. He reached up to grab a box of spaghetti, but found the shelf empty. He closed the cabinet and turned to the kitchen table where he'd left the grocery list he'd made that morning. Mom! Charlie hollered. I thought you were going to get groceries today. He tried to keep his tone light. Oh, Charlie, I'm sorry. I didn't get to it. He knew Anna's mom could pick up groceries for them. She'd done it before. But he was tired of asking her when he could just do it himself. The store was a bikeable distance away. He wrote groceries at the bottom of his list of duties. He thought about adding birthday cake to the list on the table, but he couldn't bring himself to do it. I didn't get the laundry folded either. Now his mother rose and pitched, threatening tears. That's okay, Mom, he said brightly. I'll do the laundry after I eat, okay? Charlie was glad to hear nothing else from the family room. Silence at least meant no crying. Mom had been dealing with depression since before Liam left, but since he disappeared, it had gotten even worse. Maybe she'll start to get better tomorrow, he thought, when Liam's back. Charlie turned to the largely empty cabinet. Cereal again. The clink of a spoon and the crunch in his ears was the soundtrack of dinner as Charlie leaned against the kitchen counter, bowl in hand. He turned the cereal box around so the Trix bunny would stop smiling at him, and a few minutes later he was putting his dishes in the sink and heading down to the basement. 
He ignored the unwrapped Nerf gun in a Target bag on the floor to, of the laundry room, put his earbuds in, and got to work folding. He emerged 20 minutes later, grunting from the weight of an overloaded laundry basket to find all of the lights out on the first floor. Mom had gone to bed. Charlie climbed the stairs and set the basket down quietly by his parents' bedroom door. It was time. He took down the New York Yankees poster from his bedroom wall, clearing the space Liam's Mets poster had once occupied. He then cleaned his clothes out of Liam's half of the dresser drawers. On top of the dresser next to a stack of comics waiting to be sorted into Charlie's meticulously organized collection was a photo encircled by a Yellowstone National Park picture frame. Three happy people beamed at him. Mom, Dad, and his own round eight-year-old self. Liam's gap tooth grin had once been in the photo too, but a bison's butt now occupied that space. Charlie had made Liam laugh so hard on that trip, he had shot juice out of his nose all over the back seat of the rental car. His parents had failed to see the humor. Charlie grinned. He was totally going to make Liam snarf tomorrow. When he happened upon the the when he happened upon the pair of pajama pants he had worn the night Liam vanished, Charlie stared at them for a moment. They can't hurt, right? He hurried to put them on, only to find that they were at least three inches too short. His heart sank at the sight of his own bony ankles. He wasn't the same person as he had been a year ago. He was taller, older, sadder. Not everything has to be exactly the same, he tried to reassure himself. As he brushed his teeth, he stared at the shelf where Liam's dumb baby shampoo used to sit. Somehow, despite being nine years old, Liam still hadn't figured out how to keep soap out of his eyes. Charlie scooted his own half-empty shampoo bottle over to make room. He glanced at the hallway mirror on his way to bed, his eyes catching on the spot where Liam had cracked it years ago during a tantrum involving a launched matchbox car. The glass was perfectly smooth, like everything Liam related, as if he'd never existed. Charlie's phone buzzed in his backpack. A text from Anna glowed up at him. What if it doesn't work? He, he typed back. It's going to work. If all it took was a wish, every one of my brothers would have vanished long ago. Charlie smirked. But did you ever wish for it on your birthday? It took a while for Anna's next text to arrive. I get it. If you could wish him away last year, maybe you can wish him back this year. But what if that dumb wish had nothing to do with it? Maybe it's not your fault. Nice try, Charlie texted him. He knew what she was doing. Even though Anna, like everyone else, didn't remember Liam, she was the only one who believed Charlie. As such, she was also the only one who understood his disappointment and frustration every time he pulled a wishbone, tossed a penny into a fountain, or saw the first star of the evening. Each time a wish failed, it crushed him. But none of those wishes was a birthday wish, the one that had made Liam disappear. His phone vibrated again. Just promise me you won't get all sad if he's not back tomorrow, okay? I promise. An easy promise to make, Charlie thought, since it's going to work. It's going to be great, he added, and then turned off his phone. All he had wanted for his birthday last year was for his parents to move Liam into the guest bedroom so Charlie would have a room of his own. He had begged, pleaded, and whined for about it for weeks, not asking for any other present. Don't get your hopes up, his dad had warned, but he got his hopes up. Then one year ago, sitting in the, this exact spot at this exact time, Liam had charged into their bedroom, swiping furiously at his red and watery eyes. What's wrong? Charlie had asked. I don't want to talk about it. Liam started kicking things around the room. Dude, stop. Charlie barely dodged an airborne shoot. What is up? Nothing. Obviously. Just leave me alone, Liam said, falling onto Charlie's bottom bunk with dramatic flourish that sent his stack of comics tumbling, the sound of tearing paper coming from beneath him. Jeez, Liam! Charlie shoved him off the bed, causing another comic on the floor to rip under his foot as he landed. Why are you pushing me? Liam yelped. Look what you did! Charlie held up two halves of the most recent Avengers cover. Oh, I'm sorry one of your beloved comics got ripped. Boo-hoo. 
Get out of here. Charlie shoved his brother again, again, this time with his foot. Don't kick me. Get out. It's my room too. That was when dad had torn into the room, looking as bent out of shape as Liam and demanded a silent but seething treaty for the night. Lights out. Charlie glared up at the underside of his brother's mattress until his eyes wandered over and over. He had wished for his own room. He had wished his brother would go away, disappear. And the next morning, he had. Now, alone in his bed, Charlie felt his breath catch at the memory. He clicked off the lamp, rolled onto his stomach, and reached between the bed and the wall. The threadbare edge of his baby blanket met his hand. He had crammed it into the recess on his seventh birthday, the day his dad had said it was he was too old for a blankie. Charlie would deny, even to Anna, that he knew it was still there. He never pulled it out. He wasn't a baby, after all. He rolled its seams between his thumb and index finger and closed his eyes. Whoever out there makes birthday wishes come true, I hope you're listening. Could you bring my brother home, please? For my birthday, all I want is Liam. Chapter 2 Charlie awoke with a jolt in the middle of the night. The wisps of a nightmare, hunger, a house on fire, anguish, cries slipped from his mind even as he tried to hold on to them. He stared into the dark room above him and reached his hand into the air. Still no top bunk. The bright light of his watch told him it was only 2.43 a.m. It's okay. There's still time. He rolled over, trying to force himself back to sleep. Sure, he was doomed to lie awake for the rest of the night, but mere moments later, the orange glow of sunlight through his eyelids announced morning had snuck up on him. This time, he kept his eyes clamped shut. His fingers played nervously with the piping on the mattress edge. When he opened his eyes, he was going to see the top bunk hovering over him. He was going to kick the bottom of it just like he used to, and Liam was going to be so mad at Charlie for waking him up early on a Saturday. He was going to yell, what'd you do that for, before throwing a pillow down at Charlie's head. Then his mom was going to come in and see what all the noise was about. And later, Charlie might even make it up to Liam by helping him build the world's biggest pillow fort. And he'd even sleep in it with Liam if Liam asked him to. He'd let his brother call him Booper, an irritating nickname that lasted years after a game they'd made up where, when Liam was two. Liam would push Charlie's nose like a button and Charlie would yell boop in a way that always made Liam laugh. Summoning his courage, Charlie hummed a few bars of the happy birthday song in preparation to open his eyes. He took a huge breath. He did it again. He tried to block out Anna's the text replying his mind. Promise me you won't get all sad. One, two, two and a half, two and three quarters, three. He looked. Ceiling. His, he covered his face with his hands while his eyes filled. He buried his head in pillows so no one would hear. Charlie found a slice of cinnamon toast and a Nerf gun shaped package sitting on the table when he came down sometime later. This was where it had started. This was the spot where one year ago, he had bounded into the kitchen howling, thank you, thank you, and had wrapped his arm around his mother where she sat warming her hands around her coffee mug. For what, honey? For my own room, he had said, squeezing her even tighter. How'd you guys get all this stuff out there without me waking up? His mother had squinted briefly at Charlie before taking a sip. I don't know what you're talking about. My room, it's all mine, Charlie searched the kitchen. Where is he anyway? Who? She asked, putting down the mug, her forehead creased. Liam, Charlie looked pointedly at his mom. She looked pointedly back. He tipped his head quizzically, and she did the same. Liam, he said, stretching out the syllables. Her pinched eyebrows softened. Okay, I give up. Liam who? His father marched into the kitchen bellowing, happy birthday, and brandishing a small present. He finished singing with a flourish and placed the box in Charlie's hands. Go ahead, open it, bud. Three Yankees tickets lay in the box. Like he wanted, they're for tonight's game. Charlie had never asked for Yankees tickets. He looked up slowly and asked, are these for you, me, and Liam? They're for you, me, and mom. Who's Liam? Is he on your baseball team? That was the moment Charlie's world had tilted sideways 
permanently. The conversation had degenerated quickly from there. Charlie insisted he had a brother his parents knew nothing about, his parents exchanging increasingly troubled looks. Each at times laughed at whatever joke the other was playing. Each got angry. Everyone yelled. Eventually, everyone cried. His mother hadn't stopped crying since. Now Charlie watched, walked past the toast and the present and out the door to the garage, his feet so numb they seemed to belong to someone else. Anna had tried to warn him. She had tried to save him from himself. He should have known better. Hadn't he learned yet? Charlie grabbed his bike from the garage, ready to ride until his legs burned more than the hole in his chest. But as he turned toward the street, he found he wasn't alone. Anna was at the curb, bike at the ready. She stood at the same place Charlie had first seen her five years ago, the day she had moved in and bitterly disappointed Charlie by being a girl. Her crinkled eyes and forehead asked a question she already knew the answer to. Charlie thought he might throw up if he opened his mouth, so a blank stare was all he offered. She blinked wordlessly as if to say, I'm sorry, and grabbed her handlebars, motioning with her head as she led Charlie away. They rode west toward the Hudson River. Anna and Charlie, the freaks, the figment chasers. Charlie and Anna's well-known search for Charlie's non-existent brother was a common source of gossip at Westmore Middle School. They used to be normal, their fellow sixth graders whispered behind their hands. Their social schedules, previously chock full of birthday parties and sleepovers, had emptied dramatically in their year-long, relentless quest to find Charlie's little brother, or anyone who remembered him, who recalled he was in Mr. Sheldon's class, did Minecraft, Minecraft Club after school, and was the third grade record holder for the 50-yard dash. Despite their alienation, however, Anna's support of Charlie never faltered. She stood by his side and shouted down anyone who teased or mocked him. She searched with him for the boy who was a Star Wars who was Star Wars obsessed, an infectious belly laugh and a mop of auburn hair, which amazed Charlie every day since she didn't remember Liam either. Where to? Anna yelled over her shoulder. Power plant, Charlie answered, his favorite. They left behind the heart of Kingsburg with its coffee shops, craft beer pubs, and bookstores, and headed for the shoreline. It was a place time had forgotten, left to decay in the pollution of its industrial past. Charlie and Anna dodged potholes and scrub brush bushes sprouting from each crevice beneath their tires and past the relics of the city's history, the crumbling graffiti-covered train roundabout, the boarded-up mine entrance and old mill. They had explored every broken window and crumbling cement surface over the years. All, that is, except the orphanage on the hill above the industrial side of town. Neither of them liked the idea of exploring where people had died. Charlie used to worry that his mother would freak if she ever discovered their pastime, which probably qualified as breaking and entering, but since Mom had stopped caring about anything, he decided not to worry her about it either. They ducked multiple no trespassing signs and climbed up the tower plant's four flights of stairs. Charlie dangled his feet over a huge circular ledge, where the machinery had been torn out and sold for scrap 20 years earlier. Panting, he launched chunks of cement into the air, watching them tumble and spin. Free one moment, shattered the next. Anna swung her feet in time with Charlie's, her tube socks brushing against his leg. Happy birthday, by the way. Charlie snorted and plowed his fingers through his thick black hair. I'm an idiot. She rocked sideways and bumped shoulders with him. It was worth a shot. Besides, this proves it's not your fault. Liam would be back this morning if it was. She waited a beat before asking, Was your mom up to wish you a happy birthday this morning? She wrapped a gift and made me toast, but I think she went back to bed. Charlie picked up a rusty bolt that was beside his thigh and turned it over in his hands. You know, I don't know who I miss more, her or Liam. At least your mom's here. He let out a sad sigh. Kinda. Charlie felt a familiar surge of anger. Unfortunately, it was an emotion that was always blended into a messy slurry with guilt and shame. Being furious at his mom was like being mad at a wounded puppy. Didn't she have enough problems without him wanting to shake her by the shoulders and yell, snap out of it? Charlie threw the bolt as hard as he could into the void, too hard, and he pitched forward. Adrenaline flooded his body as he tried 
to right his balance before falling off the ledge, his arms windmilled. Anna snagged at the back of his shirt, the plink, plink, plink of the bolt bouncing below, accompanying Charlie's crab-like skittering away from the precipice. Dude, if you splatter yourself all over the floor down there, I swear I will never forgive you. Charlie flopped onto his back. I'm so tired, Anna finished. And she was right. He was tired. Tired of hoping Liam would come back. Tired of not being believed. Tired of missing his mom. My dad brought home cupcakes a few nights ago, Charlie said. The ones Liam always begged for every time we went to the store. Which ones? These monster cakes with the green frosting hair and the googly eyeballs. I stared at them and just started crying. My poor dad just stood there wondering what he'd done wrong. Charlie gently shook his head but stopped when all it accomplished was grinding gravel into the back of his scalp. I went to my room, but that place is even worse. I just stood there looking at everything the way I'd left it, neat and organized. Liam's junk used to be everywhere. I thought I could possibly miss, I never thought I could possibly miss all his stupid crap. <laughs> Let's trade. I'll take your room and you can come live with Lily and all her stupid crap. Anna tossed a small chunk of cement onto Charlie's belly. Anna and her sister shared a bedroom, a situation Anna bemoaned regularly. Lily was the biggest slob in the family, but it was a title she earned against fierce competition with their three brothers. Their home teemed with clutter, chatter, and barely controlled chaos. Surprisingly, Charlie loved it. Of course, he didn't have to live there. At least Lily doesn't mess with your stuff on purpose, Charlie said. Seriously, she takes my stuff all the time. But because she likes your stuff, Charlie said, leaning up on his elbows, Liam stole my things just to bug me, like it was a game. He'd swap two posters on our wall or rearrange my baseball cards or my comic books because he knew it would drive me crazy. He was surprised to find himself smiling. Sometimes I want to tear the whole room apart, sweep everything off my desk, dump my drawers on the floor just to make it feel like he's here. Maybe that would bring him back. Anna said the only thing she had to offer. I'm sorry, Charlie. Somehow it helped. It always did. Anna was Charlie's closest friend, and yet he had despised her when she had moved in five years ago. He closed his eyes and remembered how completely obnoxious he had found her from the moment she beat him in a game of horse the first day she arrived on the block. I promise I'll take it easy on you, Charlie had said with a proud flip of the ball before his first shot. Anna smirked and said, sure, you do that. She proceeded to pound him, not just in the first four games of horse they played. For the next six months, Anna systematically outplayed Charlie at any opportunity. Soccer, baseball, tetherball, it didn't matter. Charlie came to hate her knee-high socks, her post-win celebratory cartwheels, and her stupid Oakland Raiders jersey. She could at least wear some New York gear, Charlie had complained to his dad. But Anna's lived all over. The Finches were in California last year, Denver, and Phoenix before that. Why? Mr. Finch's job moved them every year. This was the best news Charlie had heard since, he, since her arrival. Twelve months of Anna was more than enough. Then Charlie's dad dropped the bomb. But this time, they're here to stay, he said with a double thumbs up. Mr. Finch had assigned has been assigned permanently to New York. What? Charlie said slack-jawed. Why? Be nice, Mr. O'Reilly said. Anna and her brothers and sisters have been bouncing around a lot. They haven't had much of a chance to make friends before. Well, that would explain why Anna's so bad at it. His father leveled a stern stare at him. I said, be nice. Tell her that, Charlie thought. I didn't help, it didn't help that everyone else in their families got along. Liam and Lily were already best friends, making drawings for each other and screeching around their yards playing tag. Charlie and Anna wouldn't become friends until later, until he broke her arm. I need to be back for lunch, Anna said, her words echoing slightly in the cavernous expanse of the power plant. You should probably check on your mom. Yeah, Charlie sat up. He tossed one last cement piece through a hole. <sighs> Liam's coming back someday, right? Anna met his gaze but didn't speak. 
Her hesitation made Charlie's heart beat faster than his brush with death a moment before. If she stopped believing him, he was sure he would collapse into himself like a black hole. I don't know, she said finally. Good enough. Charlie rose and dusted himself off. Maybe tomorrow. Alrighty. So that is where we are going to have to end it for this time. If you want to keep going and find out if Charlie ever gets Liam back and what happened to him, you're going to want to start on chapter three. You can come and pick up a physical copy or you can check out um, Hoopla and Libby for ebooks and e audiobooks. All right. Thank you for joining me. I hope you liked this book and we'll continue on with it. I'll see you next time. Bye.